Welcome everybody and thank you for joining us today. My name is Mary Engel and I'm Executive Vice President for Policy at BBB National Programs. BBB National Programs is a nonprofit organization dedicated to creating a more trustworthy marketplace by holding businesses accountable through self-regulatory programs in the areas of advertising, privacy, and dispute resolution. Today we're going to discuss industry self-regulation and answer the questions, does self-regulation work and why? To set the table, the first thing I'd like to do is define what we're here to talk about, industry self-regulation. At its most basic level, self-regulation is when businesses choose to hold themselves accountable to standards of conduct without the need for government action or with minimal government involvement. There are many different forms of self-regulation though, and what we're gonna focus on is independent industry self-regulation, where a third party is enforcing the codes of conduct agreed to by the businesses being regulated. A few quick facts about self-regulation. It seeks to strike a balance between the innovation and disruption that businesses bring on the one hand and unnecessary or overly burdensome government regulation on the other. Its hallmarks are that it is voluntary and informed by industry participants. And for self-regulation to be effective, the standards and processes must be clear and transparent, the standards need to be enforceable, and the system must have widespread adoption by the affected businesses. With me today to explore this topic are four of my colleagues who run self-regulatory programs here at BBB National Programs, Donna Frazier, Laura Brett, Maureen Enright, and Peter Marinello. So back to the question, does self-regulation work? The truth is that it has both succeeded and failed a number of times because success depends on so many different factors. And one of the great features of it is that it can be flexibly designed to address different problems that society and businesses are facing. So Laura, you lead the National Advertising Division. Tell us what problem NAD was created to address. What was going on in the world um, of advertising when NAD was created? Sure. Um, thanks, Mary. So the National Advertising Division, which we fondly call NAD, was started in 1971. Um, at, at that time, there had been a huge growth in a new media, right? It was an explosion in television advertising and um, a huge you know, adoption of advertising as a, on television as a platform for reaching consumers. Uh, so consumers were getting new information about cleaning products that cleaned better or faster food products that tasted better or were easier to make than other things. And, you know, most importantly, probably was an explosion of advertising of cigarettes to them on television. Uh, and at the same time, you had a rise of consumer advocates clamoring for more regulation of advertising. Uh, there was a sense that the advertising messages that consumers were getting were not were misleading. You had advocates like Ralph Nader, who you know, famously advocated for a lot of different regulation over the years, <laughs> really jumping in on the, on the pile here and talking about the importance of regulating advertising and protecting consumers. You know, at, at, in 1971, when all of this was happening, uh, cigarettes were the largest advertiser on television. And in 1971, cigarette advertising on television was in fact banned. I think, you know, there was this increasing distrust of advertising that that exemplifies, you know, consumers were being advertised to for this product, cigarettes, which had been demonstrated to be um, harmful to their health. So, you know, it was a, an environment that caused both ad agencies and the businesses that were advertising and the advertising associations to come together to address this problem that consumers were, you know, distrusted advertising and they, what they wanted to do at this time was build trust in advertising, right? So they wanted the industry to work together to build trust. And, um, and, and that's what the National Advertising has done. We've, uh, National Advertising Division has done since 1971. Um, we look at advertising claims in the marketplace and evaluate them for truthfulness and transparency. And, um, and I think it has really demonstrated the ability of industries to come together and address um, this, you know, the, a potential problem for consumers in the marketplace. Uh, for the National Advertising Division, our, our goal is to hold advertising to a standard, the legal standard, um, that advertising must be truthful and transparent. Um, but that makes it different than the programs that Maureen and Donna both lead, which, um, which actually applies a heightened standard. Thanks, Laura. So speaking of programs that may hold advertising to a heightened standard, um, I'd like to turn to you, Donna, to talk about the Children's Advertising Review Unit, which you run. 
tell us a little bit about how that program was created. Sure. So we were established in 1974, soon after um, NAD, the National Advertising Division. So um, we were created at a time of considerable unrest among grassroots organizations in America who were calling out for government restrictions, specifically on advertising to children. Um, there was um, a large outcry by consumer advocates and ultimately the advertising industry collaborated and responded by creating KRU. Um, so similar to NAD, um, KRU reviews and evaluates advertising in all media for truth and accuracy and appropriateness, but we pay specific attention to the sensitivity to children's still developing cognitive abilities and their considerable vulnerabilities in knowing what they're viewing. Um, we know that what a child's brain looks like today in 2020 or 2021 is the same evolution of a brain, you know, 40 years ago or 50 years ago. But what is in front of them, um, what they're faced with, how they consume media obviously has, has evolved. And to that end, over the years, as KRU was beginning to really develop guidelines and, and best practices with regards to marketing and advertising to children, we had to take a look at um, what was happening on the internet, right? So we moved away from traditional media, still did what we do, but started to investigate websites as well. And we started to do that around 1994. And in 1996, KBOO released its first guidelines for the internet, which was two years prior to Federal Trade Commission's regulations under the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, COPPA. So I, I would say that our online privacy guidelines served as a template for COPPA. And those guidelines are unique in their ability to reach beyond COPPA and originally just incorporate not only websites directed to children, but also websites that appeal to children. And um, I think that that's where KRU's strength lies, is that it's not just about what companies' intentions are, it's actually what's perceived as well, um, both on an advertising and, and an online privacy side. So we continue to internally review our privacy guidelines. Um, and work closely um, with the FTC. And as we sit here today, um, as you know, the copper rule is undergoing a rather in-depth review by the Federal Trade Commission. So um, we anticipate a significant update to the online privacy guidelines. But consistent with how KRU carries out what it does under its ad practices, um, when we monitor websites or mobile apps or other IoT products, we see change through voluntary cooperation with the company. So we do that both on the advertising side and on the privacy side. So as I'm talking about COPPA, Mary, you were at the FTC when much of this was happening. So I'd be curious to know what was happening on the ground there. Yeah, sure. So thanks, Donna. I think you've nicely described how KRU was able to respond to shifts in how children were consuming media and actually expand its portfolio to address the new issues in protecting children from, you know, not just potentially deceptive advertising, but issues with online privacy. And yes, I was at the FTC uh, back then and, and sort of taking an observer's view of how industry self-regulation was responding to some of these issues. And, and in fact, it continued to be an issue because as we got into the 2000s, we saw real rise in childhood obesity rates. and it was something that the Federal Trade Commission was looking at, our colleagues at FDA and other parts of the Department of Health and Human Services were very concerned about this. There were concerns that junk food and other non-nutritious foods were being marketed to kids and that the government really ought to be doing something about that. Now, at the same time, of course, there were thoughts that, well, perhaps industry ought to be doing something about that on its own. And um, being well aware of KRU and how it had advertising guidelines and online privacy guidelines, some of us were thinking, well, you know, maybe KRU should be addressing um, the issue of which foods are, are marketed to kids. And in fact, the FTC, along with the Department of Health and Human Services, issued a report in 2006 that specifically called on KRU to expand its children's advertising guidelines to address childhood obesity issues. Now, as it turned out, the companies who, um, you know, supporting KRU had different thoughts about how industry could best address this. And so I'd like to turn it over to Maureen to talk about um, what the food and beverage industries did in response to the increased calls for, for regulation of food marketing to kids. Thanks, Mary. And um, great setup, Donna. 
because the FTCs and the other agencies and the Institute of Medicine and advocates, you know, there was very direct, clear messages that advertising needed to change. Food advertising to children needed to change. And the message was heard. I mean, we had data of the rising rates of childhood obesity. Um, You had these agencies. And it was obvious to the food industry and the advertising industry that something needed to be done. And then logical place to have the conversation and come up with a solution was KRU because it was already dedicated to improving advertising. And so KRU provided the framework and the audience and the necessary independence. You know, it's industry self-regulation, but it's bringing accountability from a, a third party. So after a lot of discussion, it became clear that there was a need for a brand new program. Because KRU had done a great job at looking at all types of products, not just foods, and how they were being advertised to kids and considering those vulnerabilities. Um, that's KRU's mission. But the new program really needed to look at what types of foods were being advertised to kids. It wasn't enough that they be shown in a way that was not misleading, that any claims had proof to back it up, but the industry needed to look at what foods were being advertised and what their nutrition profile looked at. And that was a really new concept. So as it evolved, it was decided we need a new program. It's going to be a voluntary opt-in program, um, open to all food, beverage, restaurant companies, but not industry-wide. And that uh, led to CFBAI, the Children's Food and Beverage Advertising Initiative, which was, it really represented a new model for self-regulation. It was a pledge program uh, that companies opted into voluntarily. So, um, you know, that was sort of the culmination of a public interest, a rising data, federal government interest, and there already being a spot to talk about children and advertising. Exactly, Maureen. So a good example, once again, of how industry was able to kind of flexibly respond uh, quickly to um, a growing marketplace need. So Peter, we just you know, heard about how the food and beverage industry came together to form the Children's Food and Beverage Advertising Initiative. Fast forward 12 or so years later, and the government and advocates are raising a lot of concerns about deception in the direct selling industry. Can you tell us a little bit about how that industry came together to respond to this concern and form your program? Well, sure. Uh, thanks, Mary. And, uh, and thanks for the invitation here to be part of this fabulous think tank here with all of my esteemed colleagues. Um, You know, it's interesting. It's interesting, like many of the other industries that we just heard about, the direct selling industry turned to self-regulation over the last few years. I think probably really in the 2010s, we really saw um, this industry in the crosshair of state and federal regulation, um, really confronted with these troublesome perception issues, right? both from consumers and regulators. Perceptions that really compromise the integrity of the industry as a whole. Now, you know, some of these issues were in fact very real, right? Claims that Salesforce members can make, I don't know, $100,000 in six months, or that, you know, this product can treat Alzheimer's or autism, things like that. But maybe some of the other criticism really didn't rise to such an egregious level. There's this industry consumer advocacy organization called Truth in Advertising kind of better known as Tina, um, that issued this report in 2017 on product and income claims in the direct selling industry. So I think the report, while it may have overreached somewhat, the real utility of the report was that it really galvanized the thought leaders in this industry and helped them recognize that they had to proactively address um, some of these issues. You know, it was interesting, Mary, on the heels of this, of this report from Tina, then acting FTC Chair Maureen Olhausen addressed the Direct Selling Association in November 2017 and strongly encouraged the industry to consider what you were talking about, effective third-party self-regulation. And this was definitely a real seminal moment. And, you know, there was some written guidance for the ML industry that was published by the FTC right on the heels of that report that really helped frame some of these issues that could be addressed in the context of meaningful, independently administered self-regulation. So it was really the sequence of events which led to the creation of the Direct Selling Self-Regulatory Council, or DSSRC, as it's now known. The program was launched in January 2019, 
Mary, three objectives in mind when we start. Provide comprehensive monitoring of the social media posts and websites of both DSA members as well as non-member companies and their distributors. Look at direct selling product and income claims in particular. And of course, any implied messages that may stem from those claims or images accompanying those claims that may, that may convey these unsupported messages. You know, of un, I guess extravagant wealth and lavish lifestyles, extraordinary earnings uh, that wouldn't be typically expected from consumers or, or potential uh, downline recruits. And finally, really restoring and enhancing consumer and regulatory confidence in the messages being disseminated uh, by direct sellers. So there you have it. Thanks, Peter. So now we've heard how you know each of the programs was developed in response to a particular marketplace need. Let's spin that out a little bit and talk about how the programs work, not just why they're here, but how they actually work to address the need. Laura, how about you, you start off in talking about the National Advertising Division? Sure. Uh, thanks again, Mary. Uh, so the National Advertising Division really does let the industry hold itself to the truthfulness standards uh, that are set by law that advertising be truthful and non-misleading. And the way we do that actually is by providing a forum for competitors to respond to particular problems in the marketplace and bring a challenge at NAD. So back in the 1970s, if they saw a misleading demonstration about how a particular cleaning product worked or um, how easy it was to make a particular food, they could bring a challenge to NAD and, um, and NAD would resolve that the same way you might otherwise go to court. Today, we're looking at issues um, that include, you know, the misleading use of consumer reviews or the misleading use of influencer marketing. And instead of companies going to court, um, which takes a lot of time and is fairly expensive, they can come to NAD and, um, and use this voluntary process where there aren't money damages for companies that come through the process, but an NAD challenge can result in recommendations that the company discontinue or modify their advertising claims. We also do sometimes find advertising claims to be supported. That, that happens uh, at the NAD forum as well. We can also open cases on our own initiative. Um, if we see an advertising trend that is undermining the trust, we can open a challenge on our own. And uh, we certainly have done it recently with a lot of digital advertising, uh, marketing, and uh, other kinds of tactics like that, um, like influencer marketing and native advertising. Uh, what we try and do is when we see new issues arise in the advertising space, we try and make sure that there's guidance for companies that are trying to play by the rules and provide that guidance in cases that we open on our own. This is the way we are really trying to support truth in advertising using the self-regulatory process. And we see that almost 90% of companies are willing to participate and comply with our recommendations. Great. Thanks, Laura. Donna, what about KRU? Does it operate similarly to NAD? Yeah, we, we do operate similarly. We also take cases and, and monitor. You know, we have a high volume of monitoring in, in all media. And our standards are embodied in, you know, our, our guidelines, which right now is, is one document consisting of our advertising and online privacy guidelines. But again, as we've talked previously here, KRU is unique because it does sit on both sides of our organization, um, advertising and privacy, and, and our cases reflect that. So our cases run the gamut from truthfulness and, and deceptiveness and um, maybe disclosure issues in, in advertising cases. And some of those same disclosure issues may also arise in online privacy cases. So our guidelines address both COPPA as well as other existing best practices with regards to online privacy. But most of our cases are found through our own monitoring. And much like Laura just mentioned for NAD, I would say that we probably have a very high rate of companies um, cooperating with us. So I would say ours is probably as high as 95% cooperation. And again, where companies choose not to cooperate with us, we'll refer cases to the FTC or um, a state AG. And we've, we've done both over the last several years. And I think reliance by the advertising industry on KRU's expertise really led to the creation of our pre-screening service. So we'll review advertising concepts and scripts and storyboards, television commercials, promotions, and websites in order to ensure truthfulness, accuracy, and appropriateness, but specifically, of course, compliance with our guidelines with regards to advertising directly to children. 
and our team collaboratively reviews the submissions and we provide constructive analysis and it's all done, you know, kind of it's a team effort. And we think that this pre-screen service really saves advertisers substantial sums by ensuring compliant advertising. So similar to our messaging to companies about how they design products with privacy by design, we hope that our advertising guidelines serve as a way for companies to be KRU compliant by design as it pertains to their ad campaigns. The unwinding of a campaign or sheer removal of an ad upon our discovery of it being non-compliant is both costly and, and complicated. So I think that our process is, is obviously working and, and helpful to the industry, and, and that's really what self-regulation is intended to do. Great. Thanks, Donna. So, Peter, um, I think like KRU, most of DSSRC's cases come from your own monitoring of the marketplace rather than through competitive challenges. Is that right? And you, can you talk a little bit about how you operate? Yeah, sure. Um, and this is really the million dollar question, isn't it? Right. We've all talked about the reasons for our particular programs, but how do we, you know, how do we solve the problem? How do we try to solve this problem here? I think there are several ways in which DSSRC addresses the self-regulatory needs of the industry, Mary. You know, when, when we started DSSRC, I have to tell you, I was really fortunate enough to have been part of several other self-regulatory endeavors over the past few decades, including, you know, 10 years uh, working at the, uh, at the NAD. So as director of this, of this new fledgling program, I tried to implement some of the more successful components of those other programs into DSSRC. And as you mentioned, you know, one of the most unique things that we do is really independently monitor the product and income representations by all members of the direct selling industry. So more specifically, we track earnings representation and product claims on various social media platforms that are used by direct selling company sales forces. And we work with a third party monitoring company, Mary, that not only crawls the web for us on a daily basis, they also manage this, this online incident portal for us, which calls our attention to potential claim infractions of pertinent FTC rules and regulations. You know, we're also very fortunate to have this very committed partner in the Direct Selling Association, which funds our program. One of the things, Mary, that we found out is that this industry has this incredible appetite for guidance on claims and compliance. So, so last year, DSSRC released its guidance on earning claims for the direct selling industry, a document that really helps define and identify direct selling earning claims for industry members to help ensure that these representations made uh, by direct selling companies or their sales force members comply with legal and self-regulatory standards. It's kind of interesting, you know, the guidance originated from this real constructive uh, dialogue between DSSRC and the thought leaders in the industry over several months. And it also refers to a number of fundamental claim substantiation principles articulated in things like the FTC.com disclosure guide and the FTC guide on the use of testimonials and endorsements in advertising. You know, this DSSRC guidance was intended to provide companies with additional clarity on things like, hey, what qualifies as an earning claim? What's a direct selling company's responsibility for claims made by sales force members? The importance of net impression and the evaluation of earning claims. Disclosures that may be necessary, you know, in connection with an otherwise truthful uh, claim or testimonial. We include a bunch of, uh, of mock examples as well. And it's through initiatives like this, you know, this guidance document and really our casework um, that we provide this educational component to the direct selling industry. We've opened 200 inquiries, since, over well over 200 inquiries since the program started. And, you know, we, we routinely schedule meetings with parties to discuss the process and, again, reinforce claim substantiation principles. One last thing, Mary, we're really excited. We're, uh, we're going to hold our first DSSRC summit for the direct selling industry this summer. And I'm fired up. Very exciting endeavor. Great, Peter. I appreciate that and your enthusiasm. I look forward to that summit. So, you know, what we just heard from you as, as well as from Donna and Laura about your programs is that they were all created in one way or another to address the problem of misleading advertising in a particular area of the marketplace. But turning now to the Children's Food and Beverage Advertising Initiative, as Maureen, you touched on a little bit earlier, the issue is not whether food and beverage advertising is misleading to children. It's more whether the foods should be advertised to children at all. 
So how does your program, how does the CFBAI address that problem? You're absolutely right, Mary. We had to kind of come up with a new paradigm because most of BBB national programs, programs, their advertising programs are a forum for bringing cases and considering ads and whether they're misleading for their intended audience, whether it's adults or you know looking at the kids. But CFBA AI goes beyond that kind of truth and advertising focus that's the underpinning for the other programs to think about how, you know, go beyond what how it's advertised to requiring its participants to actually limit what they include in advertising. And that's the essence of our core principles. Um, we have a set of principles. The 19 participants um, that have joined, they agree to limit their advertising and follow these principles. They can advertise only foods that meet our strict nutrition criteria that are common criteria for all companies. And some companies have agreed not to advertise at all to children under 12. Our principles set out the media that we cover, which pretty much tracks uh, the media that KRU is looking at and thinking about. So, you know, TV, print, radio, and, you know, a broad swath of kids' online advertising, like digital websites, mobile apps, um, YouTube videos. Uh, you know, there's advertising on YouTube videos and there's advertising through influencers. And some of them are directed to children. And we cover that too. We, in addition to the companies committing to doing this, we monitor that media. And we require that the companies provide us with self-assessments so that we can see some of the data about their audience demographics. I mean, we look at this very carefully. Our principles are very clear about what a child-directed ad is. And we publicly report on compliance on an annual basis. So we talk in our compliance reports about issues that we've spotted, corrections that have been taken, and we talk about progress under the program, looking at the foods that are being advertised. How have they changed over time? What's currently being advertised? Because I think common to all the programs is trying to be transparent and accountable for the programs and for our own independence. So it's important also to know that we think of CFBAI as incorporating kind of the, the best practices for advertising foods to kids, but these are not industry requirements. These are requirements that companies have voluntarily taken on and not all companies that advertise foods to kids have joined the program. So I think it's proved to be a strong and a durable model and a program. We started with 10 companies in 2007, we're up to 19. And we even several years ago created a niche program for small to medium sized companies in the confection field because we have some of the very biggest candy companies in CFBAI, but there was an interest in that industry in demonstrating through a third party that the whole industry was complying. But they needed something for smaller companies. So altogether, the CFBAI companies cover about 70 to 80% of food advertising on kids' media and about the same amount of ad spend. So I think it's a great example of using self-reg and developing a particular model to address a specific problem for a particular industry. You know, there was a growing societal problem, a perception that advertising needed to be part of the solution. Federal agencies, you know, leaning on industry for a solution. So here we had a, a situation where we needed fast action and there was actually a potential First Amendment problem if the government stepped in to regulate speech. Because you'd end up drawing lines, you'd end up worrying about burdens and impeding communication with adults. So I think that, you know, it could have been a long and drawn out process trying to come up with a solution. And, you know, the FTC, which is the regulator of this space, actually recognized that the marketplace can help provide solutions. And Mary, I guess I really, I should let you speak a little bit about that since um, you're a fairly recent regulator and you've kind of seen this give and take of, you know, not just society, but what government and, and regulators, how they can benefit from self-regulation. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I guess I was a regulator for 30 years. I, I think at the FTC, we thought of ourselves more as law enforcers than regulators. We <laughs> didn't have that many regulations. But um, and so with the, the maybe the bias that, you know, you always want to think that your your job is important and that what you do is necessary. So uh, law enforcement being necessary at the same time at the FTC, and up and down the agency, I think there there was always a lot of support for self-regulation, uh, recognizing that self-regulation can be a complement 
to government enforcement and regulation, not an alternative, but a complement to achieve many of the same ends. And in particular instances, actually achieving the same ends, but in a way that the government could not. So Maureen, you just mentioned First Amendment issues, and there are a number of different areas where uh, concerns had been raised about different types of advertising, usually, especially involving children. But because of First Amendment protections, it would be very difficult, if not impossible, for the government to regulate in that area. And I think, as as you mentioned, the children's uh, food and beverage advertising is a good example. If it would be hard for the government to regulate there if the advertising is truthful and not misleading. It's, it wouldn't be impossible, but it would be difficult. And and so by having self-regulation step up and address those issues, it sort of takes a, a load off of the government, takes some of the, the burden off of the government of trying to figure that out and, and allows the government to spend its resources in other areas where it's critically needed and only the government can really address like say fraud where you know you need to go into court and stop the action immediately and get money back for consumers that's not something that self-regulation can do so self-regulation has that advantage of complementing um, regulation and and taking some actions that the government can't really do or at least not do very easily um, and so i think that's one of the reasons why over the years the ftc in particular has supported self-regulation i think you know, most commissioners and chairmen since NAD was founded in 1971 have vocally supported self-regulation. It does achieve the ends of protecting consumers from misleading practices or any inappropriate practices and helps create a more level playing field, a more competitive marketplace, which of course government also wants to do as well. So, you know, I think that's not to say that self-regulation is perfect. Of course, it's, it's not. It's not a silver bullet. It has its limitations. And, you know, it's important to think about why self-regulation works and why it doesn't. Like, what can it do? What can it not do when you're crafting the program to make it effective? So actually thinking about one of the problems that government faced, um, certainly when I was at the FTC was uh, kind of an explosion in advertising claims for dietary supplements, claiming that they could prevent all sorts of diseases and health conditions. These claims are really inappropriate. Um, and certainly the FTC took many enforcement actions, but self-regulation also stepped in to help out there. Laura, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how that, how that happened. Sure, thanks, Mary. We do have that shared challenge, right, of, um, of trying to provide some guidance to dietary supplement companies and how to make truthful and not misleading claims about what their products can and can't do. Um, and they do create a challenge because uh, you have a lot of, you have a lot of different size marketers of dietary supplements from you know, mom and pop to major corporations that are making dietary supplements and making claims about what those products can do. And what became hard in the dietary supplement space was trying to provide guidance that was followed across the board by the dietary supplement makers, large and small. Um, and I think it demonstrates where self-regulation works best. And that is where you have a market leader who's trying to protect truth and transparency in the marketplace, right? When you have a company that either has an innovation in their product and they want to be able to truthfully advertise about that product and not allow others to claim that their product does the same thing, or simply a, a company that, that believes that it's really important for you know, truth and transparent marketing to, to exist in that market space. Self-regulation is a really good way for that market leader to essentially bring some discipline to the marketplace. Dietary supplements, because of the variety of size of companies that, that uh, develop dietary supplements and, and put them out in the marketplace, and the ease actually of reaching, reaching consumers these days, um, you know, you can you can market directly to consumers without much investment. Uh, but that creates a real challenge for self-regulation because it, it's hard to market or it's hard to um, manage and, and provide guidance in a marketplace that is so dis dispersed and diverse. But we do see some progress in the dietary supplement industry. We had a 18 year program with, in partnership with the Council for Responsible Nutrition to uh, provide guidance to the industry on how you support advertising claims for dietary supplements. And we certainly made a lot of traction. We opened a, a lot of cases under that program, uh, hundreds of cases under that program. 
And we also saw during the course of that time that companies were much more likely to come to us with support, scientific support for their advertising claims. And we also saw the entrance of large brands into the dietary supplement marketplace. And a lot of them uh, put a lot of science behind the claims that they make for their dietary supplements and, um, and do increasingly bring challenges at NAD for um, competitors who are making claims. On, you know, it's, it's, for us, it's a demonstrate progress when we see that happening. Thanks, Laura. Uh, Peter, what about in the direct selling space? Um, how is self-regulation interacting with the government there? And, and did the government see any benefit to self-regulation as, you know, as you practice it? Oh, wow. You know, Mary, I'm still recovering from your line that self-regulation isn't perfect. After all these years, you tell me this now, Mary, I can't believe it. Um, no, you know what? It's a really interesting question. It is. Uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, the, the direct selling industry has really been the target of some intense regulatory scrutiny, and listen, justifiably so, right? Um, and these issues didn't just pertain to unsupported claims. Um, it was really the business model issue that has plagued this industry. Pyramid schemes and recruiting issues, inventory loading, things like that. Now, don't get me wrong, but product and income claims really from these large battalions of, of sales force members, Mary, sometimes hundreds of thousands of distributors um, who are making claims for companies in some cases, they're still proliferating, but it's really these larger systemic issues which the industry needs to address. Nevertheless, from a regulatory perspective, it is the problematic income and product claims that open the door for these regulatory agencies to do a deeper dive into the company's business practices. And this is where I think DSSRC can really help. You know, our jurisdiction, as I mentioned, is really limited right now to claim evaluation, but who knows, Mary, maybe someday when DSSRC is armed with some more financial resources, we can also help look at these larger business model issues. Yeah, there are definitely larger issues there, Peter. Thank you. And I think um, that, that's something that was also seen in children's advertising. And and Donna, can you talk a little bit about that, about, about the interrelationship between KRU and the government? And actually, it's with, with COPPA, there's actually almost a co-regulatory model going on there. You want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. So, you know, I think KRU's biggest challenge is, starts with who our audience is, right? So it's children, and whether or not we want to affirmatively say it or not, it's, it's their parents as well. So, again, as you mentioned before, when you're dealing with people's children, it raises the ire of, of people, I think, more significantly than, than other issues. Um, the FTC, I think, has relied on KRU to police the space of children's advertising and privacy, um, so much so that when the FTC may get called on the carpet by the folks on Capitol Hill, they'll oftentimes defer to us and what we're doing um, in the space and um, refer directly to some of our cases. With regards to being a co-regulatory body along with the FTC, that comes along and KRU being a safe harbor under COPPA. And um, as a safe harbor, we are obligated to uphold not just what the rule says and what the law says, but as a safe harbor, we're almost asked to raise the bar a little higher than where the law goes, right? And Really, it's about policing the space and um, making sure that companies are not just adhering to the letter of the law, but are creating environments for children where it's not just robust, but it, it's a safe environment, it's compliant with COPPA, and they're going above and beyond, right? So we're instituting best, pra best practices along with just mere compliance of the law. I think when you look at our guidelines, both advertising and privacy, we have to walk a fine line between, and I, this is not, I think, um, this is not unique to KRU. I think this applies to all of our programs where we have to walk this fine line between creating guidelines that businesses can implement with as few burdens as possible, but also create a standard that stands the test of regulators and, and legislators. Um, we can't hold the bar lower than we're an agency such as the FTC holds the bar. And um, we've seen these conversations come up recently as, as we're talking to stakeholders about updates to our advertising guidelines. And some have described our guidelines as prescriptive. And admittedly, that description bothered me, but I've learned to be okay with it. And I probably even own it a little bit because I do think that self-regulatory guidelines need to be prescriptive in order to be credible and, and maintain relevancy. And for us to continue to work closely with agencies like the Federal Trade Commission who do lean on us and find great value in the work that we do. 
Yeah, absolutely. There's a reason that the industry can do more on a self-regulatory basis than the government can hold it to sometimes. And I think in the children's area, that's that's one of them, definitely. So thinking about, uh, you know, you've talked about how children consume media ha has changed over the years, over the decades, really, and KRU has evolved. And with for everybody else in the room on this issue, we all know that consumers are savvy today than they used to be. They expect more from businesses and they expect businesses to be accountable and um, increasingly hold each other accountable. So what does that mean for the future? What are what are we looking forward to in, in, in your programs? Who'd like to take that one? You'd like me to jump in on this? Sure, Peter, go ahead. You know, when I uh, look to the future of self-regulation, we've talked about you know, a lot of times industry finding itself in a very kind of compromising position regarding enforcement and regulation. It is these emerging industries that I think can really um, avail themselves of self-regulation. Industries like the CBD industry, the cannabis industry, the legal gaming industry, things like that, where you do have now these really emerging um, industries that, um, that are going to require a lot of regulatory focus and there are also industries that are replete with very reputable players who want the level playing field that self-regulation provides. And they, always want, and they also want to kind of weed out kind of the Wild West idea, Mary, where you do have some of these fly-by-night companies who are making the real problematic claims that are, that are really compromising the industry as a whole. That's where I see self-regulation going, in the emerging industry area. So I'll add that by saying that obviously in the kids space, we're seeing how kids consume media, right? It's not just linear television, which is what the case was when KRU was first established. And our guidelines were really focused on just television. And we've obviously evolved greatly. And we now know that most children, especially those under the age of 13, and I would even say under the age of 16, do not consume media on linear television, right? They're watching almost everything on handheld devices or watching everything on YouTube. They're not watching live television, but they're also on platforms where there's an immense amount of advertising and an immense amount of data collection. And, you know, I think KRU and CFBI um, have been working more and more closely together because of this convergence between advertising and data collection. And what's happening with advertising used to be very siloed between advertising and privacy. There wasn't this convergence that we see now. And, we, and what we weren't seeing that we are seeing now is companies getting in trouble with regulators because of their privacy practices that are tied to their advertising data that's being collected. So I think where we as an organization, I think have a distinct advantage is that we're engaged with stakeholders who do a good job of communicating to us not just what they're doing, but what they want to do, right? So they offer us a little bit of insight into what their tactics are, what their desires are, what their end goals are. And we have the ability to really talk some of these issues through with them and help them figure out how best to deliver what they're doing while staying compliant with our guidelines and maintaining best practices, but also maintaining this level of consumer transparency and trust. But I think what's also great about what we do is that we're also able to kind of just survey what's happening on the ground, both from the perspective of regulators, but also from the perspective of, you know, the companies that we're dealing with and keeping an eye on where things are evolving. So, right, that's, I think, what started us down the road of creating a teenage privacy program, TAP, because the conversations have been getting more and more aggressive about raising the age of COPPA from 13 to 16. And we surmise that that's not the answer to whatever the problem is that they think they're addressing. Um, treating a 16-year-old like a six-year-old online is not the answer. And we do think that this is right for self-regulation, for companies to really step up and say, you know what, before you legislate, give us an opportunity to really address this 13 to 16 space. Let's, let's figure out what needs to be done here from a privacy perspective, which I think is going to bleed into advertising as well. Again, we're not siloed. But I do think this is a perfect example of how self-regulation um, evolves and, um, you know, what the future looks like. So both Donna and Pete have underscored the real value that self-regulation can provide when you hear that confluence of things. You have that drumbeat for more oversight, more regulation, more action, more consumer protection. You have a sense that there are, there are activities in the marketplace that are undermining consumer confidence and consumers 
ability to you know play or work or make purposes. And when you have that that confluence of events, that activism for more regulation and a sense that there's a problem in the marketplace, self-regulation can really step in and provide some guidance. So whether it's an industry or an issue, um, there may be a self-regulatory solution that could be a more flexible long-term solution than increased regulation in that space. Thanks, Laura. All right, so now I'd just like to, to kind of sum up what we've heard today. I think what we've heard is how different businesses have reacted to marketplace and regulatory adversity and uncertainty by joining together to help create a level playing field by creating a common set of rules or practices, certainly to do what the law requires, but also to go beyond that and to live up to best practices. So we've seen how marketplace failure can actually create an opportunity for those businesses that are striving to do the right thing by their customers to come together with other like-minded companies and create some sort of an accountability mechanism that addresses that marketplace failure, whatever it happens to be. And of course, self-regulation doesn't completely eliminate the problems it was created to address, but it's important to note there that neither does government regulation, right? <laughs> there, as I said earlier, no, there is no silver bullet. Um, and self-regulation does have some advantages over government regulation. It can address advertising or other practices that may be difficult for the government to regulate, for example, because of First Amendment protections. It can be tailored to be effective because it's constructed by industry members who know what works and what doesn't. And it can often get results much more quickly than government action can and, and is flexible and can respond uh, rapidly uh, to changes in technology or the marketplace. Uh, finally, I would just like to point out one thing that did not come up in our discussion, but I think is worth mentioning. The costs of self-regulation are borne by industry rather than by taxpayers in contrast to government regulation. So on that high note, I'd like to thank Donna, Laura, Maureen, and Peter for your insights today, and thanks to everyone for listening. <music>